I'm, do you want me to press it? No, oh, I it's going it's, down. It's going down. Okay. I'm ready. I'm going to do it. All right. Okay, everyone. <coughs> Thank you. 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 Thank my name is Carl Weaver. I'm a wireless market and mobile device specialist. I've spent close to 30 years taking Western technology and selling it to the Far East. I started my career in 1982 studying Mandarin Chinese in Taiwan from 82 until 85. In 85, I joined the microcomputer manufacturing industry, probably the youngest Western executive in Taiwan in the microcomputer manufacturing industry in 85. Rode that until 92, came back to America, got married. My wife's from Taiwan. 93, and early 93, um, when Clinton was elected, I got my new gig in the wireless land mobile radio communications industry for a company called Zetron. Rode that up until digital cellular, jumped into the digital, digital cellular world around 1999. I've been in the digital cellular world, mostly on the mobile device side since basically 2002. Um, I take Western technologies and I sell it to the Chinese handset manufacturing ecosystem. Uh, and I've been doing that for a very, very long time. I speak, read, and write Mandarin Chinese. Uh, my career is really off the beaten track when, in terms of careers, but it is who I am and what I do. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about three important things, really important. First of all, I'm going to talk about something called eSIM, E-U-I-C-C. -C. I'm going to pass this around. This is called. This is an eSIM. Please pass it around. Um, an eSIM means embedded SIM. That's the term that's pretty much used by Apple aficionados. But actually the <laughs> official term is the EUICC, the Embedded Universal Integrated Circuit Card, the EUICC. I'll talk about that. Second thing I'll talk about is the GSMA Remote SIM Provisioning Program. This is actually something that's going to hit you like a deer in the headlights and you have no idea that it's coming. It's coming very, very fast. I'm here to tell you it's coming. Third thing I'm going to talk about is wearable payment smartwatches, but especially for subway transit ticketing, which we don't have in North America because we're damn laggards with payment security in this country. Let me say that again. Any newspaper reporters here? Okay. So we're damn laggards <laughs> you say it anyway. <laughs> with payment and security because Carl is not politically correct and who the hell cares? So does anybody have a smartwatch? Raise your hands. Okay. What kind of smartwatch? First generation iWatch. Okay, very cool. You better sell it soon. <laughs> you better sell that. Thank you. You better sell both those watches. Do you know why? No. Sell them on eBay, by the way. There's no eSIM. There's no eSIM. Any newspaper reporters, again, in this room? <laughs> I think my brother over there is. Okay. So here's, here's the news. Apple will come out with a 4G standalone smartwatch by the October, November time frame. Ooh. And if you do have a first or second generation, hell yes, you better get rid of that because when you have 4G standalone connectivity on the watch, okay, you don't need to be tethered with Bluetooth back to the device. And quite honestly, you say, well, I like Bluetooth. Well, you know what? Guess what? Bluetooth is not safe and it's not secure, nor is Wi-Fi, okay? So now we're going to really talk about the nuts and bolts of this industry, this ecosystem. I'm in the smart card world, okay? I don't want to hear software people tell me, well, you know, I, all I need is a software app. That's bull, okay? You can never protect software unless you have tamper-resistant hard, tamper hardware. That is a fact. That's reality. Apple knows that. Samsung knows that. Okay. My blood pressure is rising. My temperature is rising. I'm alive. Okay. Let's, let's go on. Let's move forward. I have your attention. All right, so embedded SIM, eSIM, why is this important? It's already in connected cars. Who has a 4G, who has a new car? You have 4G connectivity in the car. Where did that come from, God's, did that come from God? No, hell no. That came from an embedded SIM, which is already embedded into the hub of the car right now. Who has a smartwatch that's not Apple right now? Yo. Oh, yeah. Very cool. This is the Huawei Smartwatch 2. Huawei needs better marketing. But anyway, this is the Huawei Smartwatch 2. This has an embedded SIM right now. This 
can support Alipay, WeChat Pay, uh, Huawei Pay. I don't even know what Huawei Pay is. Um, and it can probably support Apple Pay or, or Android Pay because it's using the Android OS. Okay, so it probably supports Android Pay. What does it also do? In China, there's a company called Shenzhen Snowball Technology invested by NXP. What have they done? They provided a mobile payment platform for the entire subway system. I can add the Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou subway token right on this watch. Bingo! Why are wearables important? Wearables are important, I feel, because they're a lifestyle application. They're a lifestyle application because they enable NFC on the device. It isn't just the, uh, the smartwatch. It's actually NFC-enabled NFC -enabled rings. Uh, this is my wedding ring. It's, uh, it's certainly not an NFC-enabled anything. But <laughs> MasterCard has come out with a curve, K-E-R-V. Very cool ring with NFC. You can talk it up. Visa also has a program. Visa actually has a, pro pro a program where they'll give you an NFC-enabled ring, and then it has $50 from Starbucks. Ah, Starbucks creeps back into this uh, equation. I made this present. I made this prediction. Hello, come Sorry. on. Hey, have a seat. Sorry. Have a seat. Relax. It's still beginning. I made a prediction in 2009 because I was the guy who enabled NFC into all of these smartphones. I went to work for Jumalto in China in 2008 to enable NFC in all these uh, Android-based smartphones in China and Taiwan. Um, I made a prediction in 2009. I said the only way that mobile payments would scale around the world globally is if three things occurred. And guess what? If those things have not occurred, Apple had to adopt NFC on the device for the point of sale, number one. Number two, I said Starbucks had to enable NFC because Starbucks is the largest retail chain. And Starbucks gets you techy geeky high tech people with high incomes of 80, 60, 80, 100,000 and plus a year. That's, this is everybody, everybody sitting in this room. Number three, which hasn't happened, IATA, the International Airline Transportation Association, has not adopted NFC from the beginning of the entry into the airport to the, to the fact where you get your luggage and you leave. Everything can be done with NFC on a smartphone, even the immigration part of it. And Apple has a 19-point plan that hasn't been implemented because they're very slow adopting. But Air France has actually been trialing this technology, uh, and I think other companies have been trialing it. Who has also been trialing NFC? Well, actually, Costco. For two years now, Costco has had NFC on the back on their um, credit cards. It's a co-branded credit card with Costco and a city, Citibank. They've had NFC on the card, but they've not been using it because because they've been trialing it. They've been thinking about you stick the card in, you input a pin code, and bingo, you can do your payment. Too slow. Costco said that's too damn slow. So they've enabled the contactless where you just touch. Okay, bingo. The transaction occurs much quicker. So. I know that NFC is coming, but we're damn laggers in this country. I don't expect Americans to lead in this technology. Hell, we're not going to lead in this technology. So just forget thinking we will. We aren't. We're, it's no, not going to happen. It's the French, the Germans, uh, and maybe the Dutch, and a little bit the UK. These are the countries that are going to lead in contact. If they have, they will. It's basically legacy from the smart card era, the smart card industry. Okay. Um, now. Esim, what is Esim? Why is Esim important? Because Apple has already put Esim into the iPad Pro. Did you know that? You knew that. You're a smart lady. No, I actually don't think I knew Esim was in. It's in the iPad Pro, and no. actually, it's in most of these smartwatches. The Esim is in the smartwatches. It's in the yeah. connected cars. It's going into CCTV yeah. cameras. It's going into. Um, uh, smart meters, gas, oil, electric, water. They're going to use that to remotely monitor and get the data from your water bill, your electric bill, your gas bill. They, they don't need to drive by and collect that data now with a drive by. They don't have to do that. The eSIM allows that. But what's so cool about the eSIM is not the physical hardware. That's just what you see with the card there. No, no. It's the GSMA's remote SIM provisioning program. The GSMA has this program called remote SIM provisioning. Well, what is that? It's the ability to reprogram the SIM on the fly, in the field, without going to T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon. Sprint is like, Sprint needs, somebody needs to buy Sprint. Somebody needs to be, somebody needs to merge Sprint. All right, so there are three operators that are, are pretty active with eSIM right now. Verizon is focused on eSIM mostly for connected cars and smartwatches. 
AT&T is very savvy with uh, eSIM for connected cars. T-Mobile is the most savvy because they have a plan called Digits Program. I think that Digits Program is kind of experimental. I think they're going to turn on this uh, remote SIM provisioning program from the GSMA sooner or later. They need to be pushed by the public. So what happens with this remote SIM provisioning program is I buy the watch. Right now, the embedded SIM is locked, software locked, to any operator that you buy the watch from. It's locked. You can't switch profiles, but when the GSMA opens this up and when the operators accept this technology, you're going to be able to switch the profile you, switch the profile on the fly as you wish because you'll have much more flexible plans. Uh, there will be no more global roaming. The global roaming is going away with the embedded SIM. It will be gone. Okay. And it's actually starting right now. We just don't see it here in the United States. We see it in Europe. We see it in Asia. So these are the things that I'll be talking about. And actually in China, when you can do mobile payment and the subway, that means they're more sophisticated doing this technology than we do, than we are. And we need to have that technology come back here. We need that. Now, I flew in this morning to Chicago International Airport, O'Hare International Airport, and I, I couldn't resist to ask the CTA, the Chicago Transit Authority. First, I thought it was like, what, the Rock Group? No, no, no. It was, I, I asked these people, I said, have you ever seen anybody take the phone and tap the point of sale, the NFC terminals in, in your subway system? Yeah, I've seen that. I said, what about the watch? Have you ever seen that? No, I've not seen that. Well, do you know the Samsung Gear S3 has NFC and this MST, the Magnetic uh, Secure Transmission Technology, uh, friends this morning, Lupe, okay. Actually, the, the Samsung Gear S3 is probably the best smartwatch on the planet right now. Um, but I'm telling you that there are hordes of these Chinese companies that have been developing the technology in the coming year. This is just the first one. I guarantee you, you've never seen this before. You might have, might have heard about this. But this is already active. It can only be sold in Huawei stores. Huawei actually has their own stores like Apple does, but only in China. You're, you can actually buy this. And I mean, this is pretty good because you can do so many things with this smartwatch. But the smartwatch has a problem. You can't text on this. It's very difficult unless you have a swivel-like approach to the watch and this doesn't have it, uh, the Samsung Gear S3 does. You can't, really, you can't really talk to it. You need, it needs more intelligence. It actually needs AI and it needs a good voice recognition to really improve on usage of the smartwatch. But for sure, these things are going to grow, and they're going to cannibalize the smartphone market. Absolutely. And if you look at the Swiss watch industry, they were very concerned about Apple. That's why every major Swiss watch manufacturer has a smartwatch now. They all have one. Here's the problem. They don't know how to sell it. They think they're selling it for health and fitness. Well, in Asia, they don't, they don't care that much about the health and fitness. They care about payment. So the killer app is really payment. It has always been payment because payment is a lifestyle app. Now, eSIM is important. Why? Because this eSIM enables online and offline payment. You actually have two types of payments you need to be concerned with on mobile devices. Offline payment is the so-called contactless, the so-called proximity payment that's using near-field communications. But online payment is the Alipay, the WeChat Pay, uh, and various other payments that require a browser and require you to go to a mobile wallet. Uh, and then in this case, they're normally using 3D barcodes to actually make the transaction um, at the point of sale. So we need online, we need offline. Online means you need a 4G connectivity on the watch. Does this make any sense? Make any, making sense? Good, okay. Um, the ecosystem is very, very interesting because this embedded SIM, uh, gives you the opportunity to work with so many different players. There are so many different types of use cases. Uh, these are just smart devices. And actually, MNOs and MVNOs and MVNEs are going to grow. Um, I mentioned to you about how this technology works. This is just slide one. Let me go on. Because I think I still, still see deer in the headlights with <laughs> most of you people. That's fine. Now we'll talk real interesting stuff. There are five ways, OK, to secure technology in devices. There are five ways that I know of. One way is to use an NFC controller chip with the so-called ESC, the embedded secure element. Um, but you can have a plug-in for the eSIM. This is very cool. This is what NXP is doing right now, uh, mostly for payment enablement. There's something I helped to promote in China 
along with the NFC, is something called the TEE, the Trusted Execution Environment. Now this technology is basically a combination of uh, a security OS, the TEE, and ARM Trust Zone. This is embedded software security. This is embedded into the mobile app processor chip in a firewall environment. It's like, anybody here play baseball? I'm a, I play baseball and softball. I, I, Lord knows if I didn't play this sport, I'd probably go crazy. Um, who plays say, baseball and softball here? Okay, so my brother there, of course, my brother. Do you realize that, do you know what the Mendoza line is? What is the Mendoza line? 200. Shit. 200. And we had that problem with the Seattle Mariners, you know? Z uh, Z Zanino, right? They sent him down to the minors, and now he's back up and he's got the most RBIs in a single month of anybody. It's like 24 RBIs, and it's only half the way, half the way through. Okay, what is the Mendoza line? Mendoza line means if you don't hit 200, you're going sent, you're going to get sent back down to the minors. You may never come back up. Mendoza line is also for software security. The TE is somewhere on the middle of the Mendoza line, which means it's okay security, but it's not the best security. All right. So that means that basically if you use the TE, and by the way, you should use the TE if you use HC NFC, because HC NFC takes the token and puts it in the, uh, puts it in the open operating system. There's no security there. Really? All right, let's move on. I've got your attention. Let's move on. This is um, basically, it looks like a regular SIM. It's, an, it's a UICC, but it's an EUICC. And it's the regular standard M to M form factor, which means what? It's still removable. Even, the, even though they're calling it eSIM, it's, it's removable. Where's that card? Did, did everybody have a chance to look at it? Okay. <sighs> oh, I'm really glad I have your attention. Nobody's sleeping. This is good. So this is the M to M SIM. You can put it in a car, but it's kind of funky. You mean I put a SIM card in a car? Yes, that's what they were doing just a few years ago. They don't have to do it now because they're using this form of it but you can still put this in it. You can put this type of card in a handset right now if you want remote SIM provisioning standard or spec. Even, if, even though the handset itself is not ready for it, you can use this SIM card program with the remote SIM provisioning program um, and you can have it compliant with the spec. This is very, very important. So that's what this is right here, this. This is just the, we call this the MFF2 form factor. I hope I'm not boring you with this hardware stuff, but it's really important. This is the MFF2 form factor, all right? So these are all kind of solutions that you've seen. They're out there in the market now. Now this is something new. Whoa, what is this? This is a curveball from left field. You like the acronym there of baseball? This eSIM is actually, it's, an, it's actually an IUICC. What's I? I just means integrated. What they've done is people are complaining that soft SIM is not safe, it's not secure, right? It isn't. It's not safe and it's not secure. Soft SIM. Uh, operators will never accept this technology. But what has Qualcomm done? What is High Silicon, which is Huawei, by the way? Most people can't pronounce the name Huawei. It's Huawei. Anyway. All right. So, so, and then, then Intel. All three of these companies are adopting this technology, which is something called Security Processing Unit. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like the firewall in the TE, but it's not. It's someplace else, someplace else in the chip, and it's it's a place to store payment credentials. We believe uh, that you can take the eSIM operating system. All of these require a Java or or a native operating system in order to perform the the transaction. You know, in order to perform the uh, the process of uh, providing the eSIM solution. Um, we believe that this is going to be something very important. We think that cellular modem vendors are going to embed this right into the cellular modem. We, it's going to go into um, uh, baseband chips as well. This is going into, this is right, what Qualcomm is adopting right now. Okay, so it's important that you understand the way you get hardware security is taking software, in this case an, an eSIM operating system, and putting the software into security in the hardware. Okay, good. Um, this is the standard. It's the GSMA's remote SIM provisioning program. It's a program. The first phase was connected cars. We're here at phase two right now. There's a third phase. Don't worry about that. Let's, let's focus on this phase. This phase is implemented right now. First devices are expected in 2017 or early 2018. That's the first smartphone. That would probably be Apple or Samsung that would introduce the first smartphone. Why hasn't it been, hasn't it been introduced right now? 
too sensitive, very sensitive. When you tell the operators, you, you, we're going we're gonna to take away your control of the profile, it's your profile, but we're going to take control and give it to the end user to make the decision which, uh, you know, which activation to use, which subscription that they want. That's very sensitive. They don't care about the watches. They don't care about the tablets either. Apple cares, but the MNOs didn't care. Now, the bottom line is, with this embedded SIM technology, it's been pushed forward by Apple, by Samsung, and by Microsoft. <gasps> Microsoft? Did anybody know that the newest Microsoft Surface Pro has an embedded SIM announced? I mean, I knew this a year ago, but I couldn't get to Microsoft. They announced it about a month ago. What they said is the the uh, the Surface Pro, the new Surface Pro, they, they got rid of the numbers, no more three, four, five. It's called Surface Pro, it has an embedded SIM. What they say is we have 4G LTE connectivity. You can't have 4G LTE connectivity without having a way to direct the uh, the pro, you know, you have to direct to a, an operator's profile for the me, for the modem on the on the on the tablet. So this Microsoft has enabled this technology as well. So we have Microsoft enabling this technology. Samsung's got it on their two smartwatches. I think they also have it on a tablet. And we have Apple on uh, has it on a on a on a um, on a tablet right now, uh, and they're going to enable it in a smartphone eventually. This is all going to happen. What you what I'm trying to explain to you is. This is the train that leads you down to the future of technology. By the way, without this technology, you have no IoT security. You have zilch for IoT security unless you have a way to take this technology. And by the way, 4G leads into what? Narrowband IoT, 4G leads into 5G, right? <laughs> this is a, an eco ecosystem that Qualcomm has invested millions of dollars making sure that there's an evolutionary path to 5G. I know there are other types of technologies out there that provide broadband, <coughs> low uh, power, wide area, but those technologies are not for consumer electronic devices. We're talking about consumer electronic devices now. You need a big pipe, and that can only be supplied with migration to 5G. So <coughs> if you look here, here's where we are. There, it's not very clear here, but the three Chinese operators have joined. You've got AT&T. We have Deutsche Telekom. We don't have T-Mobile here, but we have lots of other key players. This is the device side of this technology. This is on the operator side of the technology. Basically, basically 60 plus. You don't see Apple there, but Apple is there. Apple is there. They just don't want their name there. Um, now, what's going on in China? This is very cool, but it's also, it's, we're, we're, my God, we're laggards in this country. I mean, the Chinese are doing more than we are, and, and we need to s take notice. Don't cry about it, don't complain, just do something about it. Invite companies like Huawei and invite NXP and invite all these companies to come and bring the technology because we need it in this Chicago Transit Authority, Sound Transit Seattle, TriMet Portland, Clipper Car down in California. We need this technology on wearables. I guarantee you, if you have a wearable, somebody gives you an NFC enabled ring and they it gave you $50 in the beginning to use at Starbucks, you're going to keep that thing. And then you're going to be able to reload it by simply using Bluetooth to the to a device or to a tablet or to a laptop, uh, and and uh, and top the top it up. This is going to be something that you use because it's on your wrist. You're not going to lose it. It's, it's rare that somebody's going to try to steal your ring finger or your even your watch. It just doesn't happen. They steal phones, but it's it's a little bit obvious when they're trying to steal your your watch. You know what I'm saying? This company called Shenzhen Snowball has enabled this technology cooperating with NXP in China. These are just some of the statements um, that show you that in China, for the bus, the subway, the taxi, the light rail benefits um, from these applications, it's really critical, but it's also lifestyle applications. The Chinese drive a lot of cars. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong, the Chinese drive a lot of cars. This, this car pollution, this, this, this traffic jams all over every major city in China. But the government is trying to do something about that. And that's why the government likes these wearable programs where um, you can go into the subway system. And the subway systems are quite good in China. And so they want you to drive less, but use public transportation more. Um, uh, there is a high percentage of wearable usage in the retail side. Do you realize that you can go into Shanghai Starbucks and you can use your NFC enabled watch and make a payment right now, or your smartphone, Apple Pay. I tried Apple Pay in Shanghai, it works fine. Uh, and that wasn't a Chinese uh, Apple uh, I iPhone. That was a U.S. iPhone that I brought into China. It works because the EMV protocol is compliant, especially in the Starbucks stores. Um, 
it's really important to note that these wearables, we're not quite seeing them here in the United States. Just go outside the country, all over Europe, all over Asia. It's just that we're laggards here, so we don't see this stuff. But, you know, it's my job to criticize, because I'm American, I can criticize my country, because I want my country to be strong. Two main mainstream apps have emerged in China. Mobile payment. China's the largest market for mobile payment on the planet. Uh, contactless banking cards, widely deployed. Actually, that's not quite correct. That, when I was working in Jamalto, Jamalto had the lion's share of all the Chinese banks that enabled that had enabled contactless on these uh, on these credit cards, and that was around 2010. Uh, ICBC was, I think, the largest provider of contactless credit cards in China. Um, major mobile payment launches in, in uh, 2015. Mobile transit. It's so big in China, people using it in the subway, in the buses, and even in the taxis. You can take the Shanghai um, uh, value-added transit card, and you can go into a taxi and you can tap it to, to, to perform the payment transaction. Wouldn't that be so cool here if we could do that? They do, do a lot of, they do use a lot of debit in China. Some people have credit cards, but there's also a lot of debit card users, so it's immediately, the transaction is occurring Im immediately. Um, Successful criteria for China's uh, transit systems is in place. Absolutely in place. Uh, China's a large, mar a large country. Mobile payment is number one. Um, offline, contactless is strong, but it's only 20% of the market. But 20% of 1.2 billion is still a lot. Um, and then, of course, 80% is the Alipay and the WeChat Pay. Does anybody here have WeChat mobile app? You know, shame on all of you who don't have this app. This is the best mobile app, chat app, that does payment on the planet. This is a great product. Why aren't you, just because it's from China, who the hell cares? Download this thing. Try it. It's really, really good. I, I use it all the time to make conference calls between my colleague in Singapore and, and uh, Chinese vendors in China and Taiwan. I make three-way calls with my mobile app all the time, and I'm not paying a penny to do that. I just use Starbucks Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? You tell me Starbucks is not your second or third office? Come on, it should be. <laughs> so as you can see, the consumer contactless habit is it's there in China. Even though we're laggards in America, it's still here. I, we're doing contactless. We're doing mobile payments. We're damn slow, but we're doing it. We realize the importance. It's transforming the user experience. It really is. It's seamless in China. Uh, commuters have been using this technology. Uh, we use it in Seattle. We have sound transit. We're trying to figure out how to get from, from uh, Seattle to, to Everett so we can have our employees get to their, make their Boeing planes. Okay, okay? Well, we're also trying to bring it over to the east side so that those, Starbucks, those Microsoft employees uh, you know, can, can commute from Seattle to Redmond. You know. Um, we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, again, a wearable strategy is very, very important for, I think, almost any company. I said that to the CEO of Starbucks. I said, you need a wearable strategy. Uh, and the reason, was, the reason for that is because I had a friend who bought a Samsung Gear S3, and he went into Starbucks and he started doing payment, and the Starbucks people were amazed. What did you do? I just used my Samsung Gear S3, which has NFC, and I just made a mobile payment. How did you do that? It's not real. It's all real. It's all happening right now. We're just laggards. We need to come up to speed. Mobile payment growth is fueled by increase in market demand for smart wearables. Listen, one day, okay, I'm going to have NFC, Bluetooth, wear. it's all going to be on my jacket. It's going to be there. And if you think I, I'm, I'm off my rocker, well, you won't be the first one who said that, but who the hell cares? <laughs> you, will have, you will have clothing that's connected. I don't know how but I'm guessing somehow your body will help to generate the power that powers the connectivity of your jacket. Of course it should be shielded, right? It, it should be shielded. Look, we have sneakers, socks that are wirelessly connected for IoT usage right now. It's gonna go to a jacket. I'm gonna be able to order NFC Bluetooth wire. Well, right on my jacket. I don't think you can put it on a t-shirt. You need, you need to... Oh, it's already there. <coughs> Some of the athletes, uh, some of the tennis athletes and others are using smart clothing. So it's starting. NFC enabled um, 
Take your only means of pain of prick and connect to that. So he's been talking about Starbucks or Jamba Juice. Oh, I love this. We have interaction in the crowd. This is good. Please, take it away. I don't have that many slides. No, we have too many slides. Contact me. Contact with me. Pay Serena Williams for a million dollar prize. To her shirt. She might want to wait more than a day for that one. It's okay. Hey, you. So we need bank level security for this, though. It's got to be. It's got to be tamper resistant security, and that means a combination of the, what I explained. Those five solutions using eSIM because eSIM is going to be a standard. These smart wearables demand integrated security, contactless functions due to ultra small size. You have very little architecture to put all the functionality that you need in a, in a normal smartphone, which is this big. You have to put all of that here. So obviously it's very difficult to do. Contact the smartwatch service in public transportation uh, in major cities. I mean, this is really, really cool stuff. I, just, I wanted to bring this to your attention basically today. Um, this is the company. It's called Shenzhen Snowball. They have a partnership with uh, NXP. NXP, as you know, is the control is the leader for contactless controller chips, and they also have an ESE, an, an embedded secure element in the chip. That's where you get the security for storing your payment credentials. Um, so Shenzhen Snowball, you might want to go uh, check it online and check out this company. They're invested by NXP, um, and they have a TSM, Trusted Service Manager, which is a payment platform for inside of China. Um, I mentioned that Sound Transit, I've been trying to get to Sound Transit and ask them, do you have a wearable strategy? I mean, I asked the guys in Chicago and they say, oh yeah, we, we, we've, we've got a wearable strategy, which is very, very cool. I mean, it needs to happen. Um, one final slide, which is basically Shings in a Snowball. They've got a one-stop shop and they're using basically NXP's controller chips. They're using a TSM. That TSM, I'm not sure who provides it, but it's a, it's a service payment, it's a payment platform for transportation and, and payment in the point of sale in the subway. Um, they've integrated SDKs, which they can supply to you, a wallet AP, APK development. They, all of this stuff is going on right now. It's, this, is what, this is what's really going to lead to a smart city. So don't tell me you're a smart city if you don't have this kind of payment activity going on in the subway right now. You can't claim to be a smart city unless you have that kind of technology. Okay. It's ridiculous to claim that's, and you don't, you're not using technology that's been around for a number of years. That's just because we're laggards. So if you look at a smart city, look at the transportation sector first. That's where they make the money first on these smart city uh, initiatives. Um, okay, that was really short. I normally have much more slides. But anyway, now I'd love to take questions. Um, uh, I think this is going to be something that really does grow. I know that you might say, well, this guy's off his rocker. Smart watches making payment. Never going to happen. Go to Asia. It's happening. Any questions for Carl? Oh, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, unlike the rest of the world, the majority of the phones are sold by the operators here. Yes. So, and you said earlier that the, that the operators lose some influence when they move to ESA. Yes. So is that going to be the reason why we're going to stay way behind this revolution that's going on elsewhere? Actually, most of the operators around the world are hesitant to move forward on the wa on the on the phone. The watch, they're fine with that. Yeah, I see that. The tablet, they're fine with that. Yeah. It's when you get to the phone that they're very hesitant and they're very nervous. And I guess it will be a global thing because some operators have turned the technology on. Singapore has turned this technology on. And I think some countries in Europe have turned it on. But I can't have a global strategy with just a few operators around the world with this technology. They're all trialing it because they have no choice. This is coming from the GSMA. The GSMA controls the wireless um, mm -hmm. uh, technology via the SIM card, right? There's originally the SIM card is managed by the GSMA but used by the operators. Uh, so the operators can't say, no, I don't want to use the technology. They can't because it will scale. The reason why it's going to scale is because Apple is pushing it, and Apple has leverage. Yeah. Samsung, a little bit less leverage, and Microsoft, even less. But Microsoft is focused, Microsoft, Microsoft is focused on their tablets and the notebooks. Imagine the future. Your notebook, not just your tablet, will have 4G connectivity, I, data connectivity. I just remember 
why Nokia never took off in the U.S. because the operators didn't want the Nokia Symbian. They didn't want all those features, functionality moving to Nokia, and Nokia never gained market share. Nokia was huge at that time over in Europe. They had like 90 percent of the and Asia. And so I'm Asia. just saying I've seen this show before, and I just wonder what's going to change. Well, the phoenix to, rises from, from Nokia. The phoenix rises from the ashes. So there's a company called HMD Global. HMD Global uh, has the right to sell the Nokia brand, but manufactured by Foxconn, a Taiwanese contract manufacturer that makes many of the iPhones. Mm -hmm. So the name Nokia is still around. It's going to grow again. But they've transferred, I think, manufacturing to India. Mm -hmm. Still some in China, but they're probably going to move lots more to India. Uh, the Nokia name survives. It's called HMD Global. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a vaguely owned company by... I don't know who, but I'm thinking the guys in Redmond have some connection with all this anyway, uh, because they failed with their mobile device strategy. But it's cool. Nokia is still around. Nokia has a great brand and a great name, and that's why it's still around. And they also have good technology. Um, Nokia is still around. It's just the handset business has been taken over by a third party that's providing third party outsourced manufacturing services, and the name is being used by somebody in Finland or some corporation in Finland. That's all that I can tell you about Nokia. Well, first of all, I, I made this statement long before Snowden went and, and, and told the world what the world already knows. Uh, in Hong Kong in 2000, I think it was 2012 or 2013, I said the largest hacking market on the planet is the Chinese, followed by the Russians, and I said, well, we Americans are guilty of that too. I didn't mention the NSA. Uh, but anyway, all my public <coughs> speaking is public and it's all on YouTube. You can find it all. Um, the problem is, is that China is the largest hacking market on the planet. Um, most people who take a very negative ad attitude think it's all the Chinese government, and it's not. There are lots of Chinese hackers who are independent, and there's also the, 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 the triads and the mafia in China who are using software talent. The, and so the problem is, yes, you have breaches in security of every single mobile device on the planet. And the real big problem, and I was mentioning that to Audrey, uh, do, I, do I get to an answer this one more question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the real big problem is we have no ethics training with all these software and hardware developers around the world. There's no ethics training. The software is it's outsourced to everywhere on the planet and there's no way to legitimately in a very short period of time validate that malware and Trojans have not been put into these devices. Uh, because sitting back in Redmond with my Microsoft, oh, I'm doing my Microsoft software, right? Actually, no. They're outsourcing lots of it. And then the hardware is all in China. Hello, Houston. You've got a problem here. <laughs> the largest hacking market on the planet, okay? is designing all the hardware that we use. This, all this stuff is coming from China. Uh, and then China we acknowledge, and they probably even acknowledge themselves. Yes, they're a hacking country, um, but it's not necessarily all cyber espionage. It's independent sources, the triads, the mafia, blah, 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 blah. And it's not just China. It's the whole world that's hacking. Because our software and hardware people don't ha haven't had ethics training because you know what? It's the smell. It's like opium to be able to make a simple software, a malware program, out of sight, out of mind. I give you the program, I make it, out of sight, out of mind, you want to sell it to somebody else on the on the dark web, go and do it. I don't care. I, you, you gave me the money, I made you a program, my hands are free. This is the mindset. It's also an ego thing. So we're never going to stop security. And I say we're never, we're never going to stop security unless we have ethics training with all these hardware and the software people. I'm not politically correct. And you know what? I can... I can afford to be who I who I am because well anyway that's it. So that's kind of your answer. <laughs> On that note. That's your answer. Yeah. It is Thank what you, it is. Carl. You're welcome. Uh, all right. Oh, sure. Jessica. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Thanks.